what we can do for the long-term financial integrity of this country. Mr. President, I yield the floor, and I thank the senator from uh, Virginia for his indulgence. Mr. President. The senator from Virginia. Mr. President, I rise uh, to deliver just a status report what the government shutdown has uh, meant to Virginia this week. I gave one last week, and I'm back on the floor to share some additional news. I want to associate myself with the comments of the senator from Florida. I'll talk about some, some similar effects. And these effects are felt everywhere. It's not just furloughed employees. It's contractors. It's local communities and nonprofits. It's the housing market. And so let me talk a bit about Virginia. Uh, some of you, the pages might have been on the floor last week, I talked about a, a tiny community in Virginia, Chincoteague, an island that is a barrier island off the eastern shore of Virginia. It's not the place that you might think of when you think of where would a federal shutdown uh, effects be felt in a very specific way. But Chincoteague's economy is oriented around tourism. There's a national seashore and a national wildlife refuge that are there adjacent to Chincoteague Island. And so these few thousand people over the years have built up an economy that is hotels and motels, restaurants, grocery stores, drive-ins, other shops for visitors. And the fall is a very busy time. The island gets about a million and a half visitors a year, and they're coming to the National Wildlife Refuge and the National Seashore. Well, on October 1, when government closed down, the Seashore and Wildlife Refuge closed down. And so the visitors have stopped coming. And all those businesses, all those small mom and pops, and I can see the faces of Tommy and Donna and Jack Tarr, the mayor, and Glenn and Jane, my friends over there, they've all called me to say, we are hit so hard because this is a busy time for us and, and we're closed down. Uh, last weekend, there was a huge festival. There's a historic lighthouse on the island. They've been working for six years to restore it. The opening was last weekend. They were expecting hundreds or even thousands of visitors. They had to cancel it because it's on the wildlife refuge. This weekend, another big festival. Some of you might have read the book Misty of Chincoteague about the Chincoteague Island ponies. Kids read this book, the ponies that came there from probably Spain, swim across the sound to Chincoteague twice a year, get shots, get inoculated in the spring. Some are sold for population control so they don't overrun the island. Well, this weekend was the fall pony roundup. And they had to cancel it because the wildlife refuge is closed. So it's just a tourism event. It hurts all the businesses, but it's more than that. It's a fundraiser. It's a fundraiser for the volunteer fire department that keeps every home and business on Chincoteague safe. They don't have a fire department other than the Chincoteague Volunteer Fire Department. They have two fundraisers a year. This weekend was one of them, and they've canceled it. And the Volunteer Fire Department put up on their website, the Fall Pony Roundup is closed because of the childish and idiotic antics of our government. The other main economy in Chincoteague is NASA. There's a facility at Wallops Island five miles away, and over 80% of the 1,000 employers and contractors who work at NASA five miles from Chincoteague Island are furloughed. So you pull the guts out of the tourism economy that this community relies on, and you pull the guts out of NASA that the community relies on. This community has been devastated by the government shutdown. And why? Why? Mark Wright is a retired lieutenant colonel from the United States Army who served in the United States Army for 23 years, including service tours in Iraq. Very, very solid veteran. We're so proud. One out of eight Virginians is a veteran, an amazing, amazing number of people. When he retired, he got a job at the Pentagon as a civilian, a DOD civilian. He got that job earlier this year. Mark Wright was furloughed earlier this year because of the sequester with a wife and two kids in elementary school, furloughed, days off work, less pay, got through that furlough, October 1 furloughed again. And so this veteran who served his country, put himself in harm's way, fought in theaters of battle more than once, has now been furloughed twice this year. Mark Wright and his wife and children live in an apartment in Stafford County, south of D.C., they wanted to buy a home for the first time in their lives. They're, they're in the housing market. But they've decided that they can't buy a home now because he doesn't know whether he's going to have a paycheck to be able to make a mortgage payment with. He'll be lucky enough to keep making the rent payment every month. That hurts their family, but it also hurts the real estate market in Stafford County. Just this week, it was reported that foreclosures in Virginia are up 52% 
from August to September, the biggest jump since the start of the recession because of the effects of sequester and these kinds of foolish antics, as the volunteer fire department described. And so what Mark Wright and his family are asking is why? Why? Why are we doing this? I had an employee roundtable with about seven furloughed employees and contractors on Wednesday afternoon in my office. They shared their anxieties about their own finances. They shared their anxieties about having kids at home and not getting a paycheck and what it would mean to them. I asked one, tell me about your family, and he said, I'm lucky. I don't have a family. I'm lucky. I don't have a family. And then he caught himself and he said, well, no, I actually wish I was married and have a family, but for now, when I'm not getting a paycheck and I don't know whether I will get a paycheck, I'm lucky. I don't have a family. And this was a DOD civilian who was a West Point grad who'd served as active duty Army for 10 years as an Army officer and fought overseas. Others talked about how it felt to be kicked around just because they're trying to serve their country. One said, I've gone on unemployment. I never wanted to go on unemployment, but I have to for my family. And even those who were financially secure talked about, I'm looking elsewhere for a job. Why would I put myself and my family through this? I, I, I have other skills. Maybe I can't serve the public anymore if the Congress isn't going to back me up. Why are we doing this to these people? A Virginia business that I'm going to leave nameless called me the other day, thousands of employees in Virginia. The shutdown caused their revenue, their weekly revenue, to fall by 85% immediately. They're still doing work, and they are still being told, because they're contractors, that they will get paid. They're just not being told when they'll get paid. But they're paying for rent, office rent, and they're paying for utilities, and they're paying salaries of employees, and they're paying monthly health insurance premiums. So they don't know when they're going to get paid, but they're having to write checks to others every day. The owner of this business said, a few more weeks of this, and we will be bankrupt. And hundreds of people will lose their jobs. Why are we doing this to these businesses? Mr. President, yesterday you were with me in a, a hearing before the Armed Services Committee, and a woman by the name of Joanne Rooney was nominated to be Undersecretary of the Navy. And I asked her a question about morale in the Navy and in the Pentagon now. And her answer was interesting. She had been working, Joanne Rooney, in the Pentagon for quite a while and then left a year ago to go be a president of a women's college. So she's been away from the Pentagon for a year. And now she is back in the Pentagon as nominee to be Undersecretary of the Navy. The Navy's pretty important in Virginia. And she said the difference in the Pentagon and with the Navy folks she's working on from when she left a year ago to today is just completely stark. Because in the year she was gone, the furloughs hit, and now the shutdown is hit, and she's walking around the halls and looking at how people are responding, feeling like they're not supported when they're doing this important mission. And she had one question, why are we doing this to people who are working for the United States Navy, who protect us every day, who we count on to protect us every day. Why? We know, as the Secretary of uh, a Senator from Florida said, that the House pushed this shutdown through unwillingness to have a budget conference. We passed a budget in March. We wanted to sit down and find a budget compromise with a very different House budget. We were going to have to compromise and, and do that, but Senators and House members have blocked a conference and with no conference, you don't get a compromise. With no compromise, you don't get a budget. With no budget, the government shuts down. And so they push this to a shutdown, and only after the shutdown have they said, all right, let's talk. But, but yesterday, they revealed a new plan in the House. And their plan was, we need to make sure we don't default on our debt, but, but after 11 days of shutdown, we just want to keep the government shut down. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure we pay our foreign creditors, but we want to keep the government shut down. Why? Why cause this pain? Why hurt the economy? Why push businesses to the brink even of bankruptcy? Why harm the housing market? Why degrade and devalue public servants, especially those who are veterans? Why jeopardize cities and towns like Chincoteague? Why hurt nonprofits like the 
Chincoteague Island Volunteer Fire Department. Why leave families vulnerable to unemployment and force them to go on un unemployment for the first time in their life? Why cause all this pain? No one, no one in this country is benefiting from the United States government being shut down. And so why is the House continuing to insist that this government remain closed? I keep reminding, and I am, I am continually reminded of those words of the founder of the modern Republic, of the, of the Republican Party, the founder of the Republican Party, Abraham Lincoln, 150 years ago. At Gettysburg, Mr. President, you know what he said at the end of that amazing speech. He resolved, and we resolved, government by, of, and for the people shall not perish from the earth, not for a year, not for a month, not for a week, not for a day, not for an hour, not for a minute, not for a second. Why can't the House agree to open the government and stop all this unnecessary pain? Thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor. Uh, the Republican Whip. Thank you, Mr. President. Tomorrow morning, unless it's otherwise changed, we'll be voting on the request from the majority leader and the president to raise the debt ceiling more than $1 trillion. Actually, it won't be a dollar figure. It'll actually be suspended for roughly a year, the debt ceiling, that is. But just so everybody understands exactly what the majority leader and the president are asking us to do, America's maxed out our credit card. It's about $16.7 trillion. Now, I know we talk about millions and billions and trillions as if we had, could actually conceptualize what that means. But here's an interesting comparison. Under President Obama, He's been in office about five years now. Our national debt has gone up $6.1 trillion. The debt accrued by all 43 previous presidents was $10.6 trillion. So now our national debt is $16.7 trillion. President Obama has asked to raise that credit limit another trillion dollars. But here's the catch. If he had a plan to actually deal with how we're we going to repay or pay down this $16.7 trillion, then maybe there would be a discussion. But what he wants is what he called a clean CR, excuse me, a clean debt ceiling. That's a blank check. That's a blank check. President Obama wants a blank check to continue to borrow more and more money. Not so we, the present generation, can live up to our responsibilities to make sure that we are fiscally responsible, but rather to foist that debt off on the next generation and beyond with absolutely no plan in place to repay it. Now, we've heard discussions about grand bargains. We were with the uh, President this morning. He was kind enough to invite Republicans in the Senate over to the White House, and he himself sort of chuckled about the grand bargain that he had been pursuing and that Speaker Boehner and others have been pursuing over the last few years. And he likened it to a unicorn. In other words, a mythical creature that no one's ever actually seen. That's what the grand bargain is, at least under this administration. We reminded the President this morning that none of us wanted a government shutdown. This is not what we actually want. And they were all eager to end it. But we also told the President it's now the time, and divided government is perhaps the best time, to end our fiscal crisis and to be responsible for the $16.7 trillion and come up with a payment plan. You know, if you uh, went to the credit card company and said, I want to raise my credit card limit another $10,000, they say, well, what's your plan to actually pay down the debt you've already accumulated? If you come back to us with a plan, then maybe we can talk about raising the limit on your credit card. 
But as I said, for the 220 years between the start of George Washington's presidency and the end of George W. Bush's, the federal government has accumulated $10.1 trillion in debt. During the Obama presidency alone, it's been $6.1 trillion, and if the president gets his way tomorrow in the vote we were go we're going to have to get a blank check to raise it another trillion plus, it won't be $6.1 trillion, it'll be $7.1 or $7.2 trillion with no plan to pay down the debt and to deal with the impact of this growing indebtedness on our economy and on our next generations. But it's important to remember what the president himself has said about the debt. In 2008, when he was a member of the United States Senate, he said adding $4 trillion to the national debt was, in his words, irresponsible and unpatriotic. That was President Obama back in 2008. Yet here he is again asking for a higher debt ceiling, debt limit, and no plan to repay the 16.7 or any portion of it. President Obama is also the same person who said in 2009, he said, I refuse to leave our children with a debt they cannot repay. He's the same person in 2010 who said that America's massive debt keeps him awake at night. I can't imagine he's getting much sleep these days, if that's true. And this is the same person who, in 2011, echoed the comments of the former Chief of Staff, excuse me, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, who, when asked what his biggest concern was as Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he said the greatest long-term threat to America's national security is America's debt. President Obama said he agreed with that. And finally, President Obama is the same person who in 2012 said he was running for re-election, quote, to pay down the debt in a way that's balanced and responsible. Well, the most amazing thing I thought about the meeting we had with the President this morning is that he was actually taking credit for a reduction in the deficit. Now, of course, the deficit's different from the debt. The deficit's how we measure the amount of money coming into the Treasury and how much goes out in a given year. And now we're spending roughly 16 cents on the dollar of borrowed money and other more money that was coming in. But the President actually was taking credit for the annual deficits, deficits decrease now, if the deficit can be zero this year, we still have $16.7 trillion in debt. Those are related but different issues because the debt accumulates over many years where you spend more money than you have actually coming in. But the President was taking credit for the reduction in annual deficits when, in fact, if you look back, you know, the two reasons why the deficit has gone down this year is because, number one, one of the largest tax increases in American history that the President demanded in January of this last year. That was the fiscal cliff negotiation. And secondly, it was the Budget Control Act and the sequester, which has actually capped discretionary spending for the last two years. That's what's caused a reduction in the deficit, not anything else. So, now the President said it's uh, no big deal, this debt. Sixteen and a seven point seven trillion dollars is no big deal, and you know what? Seventeen plus trillion is no big deal either, to hear the President say it today. So now the President's changed his tune. Earlier this year he told ABC News, we don't have an immediate crisis in terms of debt. In fact, for the next ten years, it's going to be in a sustainable place. Well, besides being completely irresponsible <coughs> and not making the decisions today and rather kicking the can down the road to the next generation and beyond, this high debt is having a present-day impact 
on slow economic growth. All you have to do is read the Congressional Budget Office reports and they say, well, when the federal government borrows this much money from foreign governments like China and elsewhere, that's money, they, the federal government's actually competing in the marketplace against the private sector for, for credit. And it actually drives down the private sector investment. And with the debt this high, people know something's going to happen. Either the federal government's have to, going to have to cut spending to deal with this debt, or the president's going to want to raise taxes again. And that's exactly what he's requested year after year. But speaking of the next 10 years, the president's latest budget proposal, which he unveiled last in April, would increase our debt by $7.4 trillion over the coming decade. And it would also raise taxes by another $1.1 trillion, even though the president's already raised the debt by $1.7 trillion, excuse me, raised taxes by $1.7 trillion already. There's a reason why our economy is growing so slowly, why the private sector is sitting on the sidelines rather than investing and creating new jobs. There's a reason why the percentage of people active in the workforce is at a 30-year low. That's, so, that's called the labor participation rate. All you have to do is Google the Bureau of Labor Statistics and it'll tell you what the labor participation rate. It is at a 30-year low, which means that, Mr. President, I'd ask for a unanimous consent for an additional two minutes. Without objection. So, Mr. President, not only is the unemployment rate high, unacceptably high, those are people still looking for work. We know that more and more people are simply giving up because they've quit looking, and they're reflected in that smaller percentage of people actually in the workforce. So, as we all know, the President has had multiple opportunities to make that grand bargain on long-term debt reduction. He's endorsed a grand bargain, but walked away from his own bipartisan fiscal commission, the so-called Simpson-Bowles Commission, in December of 2010. He might have also endorsed the grand bargain put forward by the Bipartisan Policy Center's Domenici Rivlin Commission, but he walked away from that one, too. Mr. President, President Reagan negotiated with Tip O'Neill. President Bush, 41, negotiated with George Mitchell. President Clinton negotiated with Newt Gingrich. President Bush, 43, negotiated with Ted Kennedy. That's what presidential leadership requires and which is so obviously missing in this context. I hope the president will follow up on this meeting we had this morning and begin the kind of negotiations that would provide a payment plan to pay off the debt that America already owes and by the way, it's not just America, it's every man, woman, and child in this country. Before he comes back here and asks us to raise the credit card limit by another trillion dollars. Mr. President, I yield the floor. The Senator from North Dakota. Mr. President, yesterday I came to the Senate floor to talk about how the government shutdown is affecting North Dakota ranchers and farmers, particularly my ranchers who were hit by last weekend's storm and lost a vast number of cattle um, and uh, jeopardized their livelihood for years to come and aren't getting the services that they need from USDA and from the Farm Service Agency. But today, I want to talk about another devastating uh, consequence of this shutdown, and that is the consequence of this shutdown on Indian country in my state, and I undoubtedly Indian country all across this nation. In North Dakota, we have five Indian reservations, which are home to many Native American families. These are communities where economic development and many times employment has been trying to get a foothold, trying to catch up and where many, many, many of my state's most vulnerable individuals live. We have heard and made much about the United States living up to its obligations, its contract obligations, its obligations to the, the entities that hold our debt. But we haven't talked about the United States living up to its treaty obligations to Indian tribes in this country. And this shutdown poses a serious, 
and I am not exaggerating, a serious threat to the basic services of the, federal gov the federal government provides to Native American families as part of its trust, its contract, its obligation to Native Americans and Native American nations. Um, when when I, I, I recently had a discussion with um, tribal chairs all across North Dakota, um, as I was hearing more and more of the kind of horror stories that you hear when all of a sudden uh, uh, weather is coming and food assistance is needed and fuel assistance is needed. And the stories that I heard, I want to share with, um, with this body today, Mr. President, because they are telling stories about how foolish how foolish and how dangerous this government shutdown is to many, many very, very vulnerable families, particularly vulnerable Native American families. And so, um, just by way of introduction, most of the five tribes in North Dakota are direct service tribes, which means BIA itself performs critical functions to help Native American families. So BIA is, is the place where you go to get that assistance. With the shutdown, there are little or no BIA employees in each reservation to carry out this very, very important work. That means BIA's general assistance programs are no longer able to serve, for example, the 600 families on the Turtle Mountain Reservation who would otherwise receive an average of $97 per person to meet essential needs of food, shelter, and utilities. And I will tell you, the food banks and the food pantries are overrun. It is not an exaggeration to say that this shutdown has caused people in the Turtle Mountain Reservation to go hungry. At the Spirit Lake Nation, um, something that we've heard a lot about in the last year where social services are stretched to the max, where we have problems in even a fully funded government. Today, the vast majority of BIA social, child social service agencies have stopped leaving children stuck in limbo in the court system, waiting for someone to find them a safe and decent home. Uh, just some examples, uh, Mr. President. The woman, a woman wishing to report a sexual abuse of her son uh, has been attempting to uh, contact uh, Child Protective Services for over a week now. When she went to the office, the doors were shut, and the 24 uh, our on-call person didn't answer the phone. At the same time, BIA law enforcement is limited, limited, and this is, there, there's a lot of acreage out there um, that they have to cover, is limited to one officer per shift. They are patrolling 252,000 acres with one officer. At the Sisson and Wapton Reservation, almost 40% of the tribe's ongoing budget consists of federal funds. The tribe is preparing to furlough more than 200 employees. Right now, the tribe is able to pay them out of carryover funds, but unless the government reopens soon, it won't be able to afford to pay these employees and they'll be furloughed. Um, in, a, in a couple examples of great tragedy, the Sisson Wapton community recently lost a three month old baby, and because of the shutdown, the mother has been turned away for burial assistance for her child. Gerald Thompson, uh, elder at the uh, Sistan Wapton and a Vietnam vet, and I know on the floor with me is, uh, is our senator from South Dakota, and he can attest to the great number of um, Native American uh, who serve our military in a much higher rate than almost any other group. And he, uh, Vietnam vets, proud Vietnam vets, he receives a small federal stipend which is not even enough to cover the basic essentials. He's no longer, all of that's no longer available because of the shutdown. His wife is suffering from diabetes and stage three kidney disease. He worries about not being able to afford to dr the gas, to drive her to Fargo once a week. And he wonders how he is going to buy propane and heat for his family and his home. At Indian Health Service, health care workers such as those at Standing Rock um, recognize uh, people still need medical attention and so they're still coming to work. No promise of a paycheck and probably some people would argue here doing so illegally. 
The Mandan Hadats and Arikara Nation, which is at the epicenter of our oil and gas development in the Bakken oil shale in North Dakota, will see that development slowed. You know, there's always competition, Mr. President, for rigs in North Dakota. Where are those going to move? And everybody's waiting for the rig to show up and begin to drill their wells. The tribes have had a tremendous opportunity not only to develop the resource that will help them economically, but to develop this resource, which is moving us in the right direction for energy independence. But because of the shutdown, MHA Nation is losing a substantial amount of federal oil and gas revenue. Right now, the tribes aren't e able to get energy development agreements. They can't get drilling permits approved or have environmental uh, impact assessments completed because BLM and EPA are shut down and not available. Those rigs will move someplace else. The tribes has hundreds of drilling uh, permits waiting approval and this is only going to delay them further. Situation is also dire in urban Indian communities. Um, UTEC, the United Tribes, uh, is one of several tribal colleges that serves over 600 students trying to better themselves and another 300 children that attend their K-8 through elementary school on the college campus. But because of that shutdown, they're reducing those education services and those edu to both their students, the college students, and to the children who live on, on that facility. You know, the list goes on and on and on, and it will only get worse. And if we continue to not address this problem, we are turning our back, turning our back on these very real needs, but I think also importantly, turning our back on an obligation that this country, country undertook when they signed treaties with the tribal folk, people of my state. All across North Dakota, families, workers, children, people who are disabled um, are losing access to services and assistance and are losing their paycheck. Why? Why, are they, why is this happening? Because Congress, arguably the greatest body ever envisioned the greatest democratic body ever envisioned is bickering and plagued with inaction. House Republicans continue, I think, to uh, uh, bring up individual bills that only address the issues of the day and programs that have only been written about in programs. Whenever there is a headline, we can fund that because we want to say we're responding to those needs. Well, I think I need a headline for our Native American families who are in dire straits and for um, the Bureau of Indian Education as well as BIA. Um, so I ask, what about Native American families who aren't able to get critical social services to afford food or housing because BIA is closed during the shutdown? Where's the bill for them? And also equally important, where's the public safety for them? Where's the public safety for those tribal members? What about the ranchers who lost a huge percentage of their herd, not only in my, my state in the southwest corner, but also all across West uh, River in South Dakota, who can't get assistance from the Department of Agriculture? Where's the bill for them? What about our young farmers who are trying to build the farms of tomorrow and feed our country who aren't able to receive their income checks because Farm Service Agency is shut? They can't even get their money. So where's the bill for them? And what about North Dakotans trying to start small business or get a home mortgage and aren't able to access those federal programs? Where's the bill for them? It is just time that we stop this. It is time that we respond to the very real hurt in America, the very, the very problems. You know, you, you hear a lot about who's winning and who's losing politically. You know what? That is a sad day when that is the deliberation that we have because it is the American people that we are here to serve. It is the American people that we have an obligation to and we need to end this impasse and we need to open up the government. My people in Indian country in North Dakota need and want and believe that they've earned that respect and earned that uh, uh, commitment to their treaty rights. Thank you so much Mr. President. I yield the floor. No, no, that, that. Mr. President, the Senator of South Dakota.
Mr. President, uh, a week ago today, Western South Dakota was preparing for a coming storm, but no one had any idea it would be one of the worst and most devastating snowstorms in that area's history. Um, I grew up in Western South Dakota. I was born and raised there. Uh, we saw a lot of nasty blizzards over the years, uh, storms that sweep through uh, the middle of our state and all across our state, and the destructive impact that can have, the way that it would close down roads, uh, the difficulty that it would create for, for people, um, and obviously the loss of livestock that comes with that. We've seen uh, in, over the years blizzards that have uh, taken their toll on uh, one of our state's most important industries. But this, the uh, storm damage that I saw yesterday when I toured uh, western South Dakota really was epic. You can't look at the mountains of branches that were piled high waiting for disposal or the gut-wrenching scenes of fence lines, draws, and pastures that were scattered with dead livestock. This snowstorm started out, Madam President, as heavy rain, and I know the distinguished uh, chair had uh, much of this in her state of North Dakota as well, but that soaked the livestock. Well, then it turned into a raging blizzard with heavy snow and sustaining winds of 60 to 70 miles an hour. These winds drove livestock for miles, some more than 12 miles from their pastures. The fortunate ones lasted through the storm miles from their origination, but still alive. As I speak, South Dakota ranchers are still assessing their losses, trying to determine ownership of those that survive but are miles away from home and hauling away or burying the tens of thousands of dead livestock. To add even more challenges to an already devastating situation, this area is now experiencing heavy rains. Flash flood warnings have been issued this morning for areas of the Black Hills with an additional two or more inches of rain in the forecast. Mr. President, this storm damaged areas of 17 counties in western South Dakota that contain more than 6,000 ranches and more than a million cattle and sheep. For most of these ranchers, their livestock is their sole source of livelihood. These ranchers have a 365-day-a-year obligation to care for their livestock, which they have done for generation after generation. And I want to show you just the impact, Madam President, of uh, this storm and what it did to um, some of these livestock. This was an area that we saw from a helicopter yesterday, where a uh, low-lying area where there was some water. As you can see, there are upwards of 50, 40, 50 head of livestock that are lying there dead in that area. Uh, we saw numerous examples uh, just like that yesterday. This, uh, Madam President, is a, a photo that we took yesterday of trucks, rendering trucks that are coming to pick up uh, some of the dead livestock. And as you can see, not only are the trucks filled up, but there are uh, livestock along this road. And we saw that situation, uh, that image over and over again yesterday as well along highways in western South Dakota. And so the, the point I'm simply making, uh, Madam President, is this was an, an incredibly powerful, impactful storm that uh, created enormous amount of damage to the, uh, the number one industry in western South Dakota. And the people who work the land, people who raise these animals, they're independent, they're hardworking. Uh, these ranchers are the best friends and neighbors that anyone could have, always willing to lend a helping hand. And they're the first to provide assistance and the last to seek it. And the best thing that we can do right now, the most effective assistance that we can offer them, Madam President, right now is found in the livestock disaster section of the Farm Bill, which is passed here in the Senate, is now passed in the House of Representatives, and is awaiting action by a conference committee. The Livestock Indemnity Program, known as LIP, was something that Senator Baucus and I authored as part of the 2008 Farm Bill and it provides much needed financial assistance to these livestock producers. But in order to get this assistance to them, a new farm bill has to be passed. This program, the Livestock Indemnity Program or the LIP program in the Farm Bill, is fully paid for with cuts in other farm programs and has eliminated the need for ad hoc disaster assistance that was the standard emergency assistance in past years. Uh, I remember past years when I was a member of the House of Representatives, Madam President, something like this would happen and we would have to come to Congress for ad hoc disaster assistance, emergency assistance. <clears throat> the whole point of getting a disaster title in the Farm Bill was to eliminate the need for that ad hoc uh, disaster assistance on an, on an annual sometimes basis. 
And so this title was put into the Farm Bill back in 2008. It created a permanent program, uh, paid for, and as I said, the, the one in the Farm Bill that is being considered now uh, is offset by cuts other, where, other, other areas of the Farm Bill. And what we're waiting for is for the conferees to get together in a conference to work out the differences between the two bills and to report them back to the House and to the Senate where they can be voted on, hopefully passed, and put on the President's desk. And that's what's going to take to get assistance back to these livestock producers because the existing uh, disaster title, the, uh, as I said, Livestock Indemnity Program in the uh, disaster title of the Farm Bill, expired, expired at the end of 2011. And when we passed a bill in the Senate in 2012, it reauthorized it. Um, and in the Farm Bill that passed this year, it has been reauthorized. But until we get the Farm Bill passed, that authority that can help producers in circumstances like this uh, no longer exists. And so that's why we have got to get conferees together in a conference committee uh, and ultimately uh, a bill on the President's desk that can be signed into law that would allow the Department of Agriculture to issue the regulations that are necessary to put this program uh, back into effect. Now, I've been encouraged by reports that I've heard that they're going to soon name conferees uh, to move a farm bill forward in the House. I wrote a letter earlier this week to Speaker Boehner asking him to name conferees uh, so that the conference committee could begin its work and make this assistance available to livestock producers. I've also sent a letter to Secretary Vilsack asking him to determine that the Farm Service Agency personnel in the impacted counties are essential so that they can open these offices and begin the process of preparing damage assessment reports that are going to be needed for federal disaster declarations. And uh, the distinguished chair mentioned in her remarks uh, the need, uh, the impact that this is having uh, in western South Dakota and western North Dakota. The Farm Service uh, Agency personnel are not working, and in this circumstances, they are the ones that the producers would go to and that the uh, states and affected parties would look to to do the damage assessments. And so I'm hoping that Secretary Vilsack, he has that authority, particularly in this sort of a situation where you have an emergency, to declare uh, these people as essential and get them back on the job so they can begin those damage assessments and, uh, and prepare the way for hopefully when a farm bill passes and the disaster title is, uh, is authorized again. And so those are a couple of things that, that have to happen, in my view, Madam President, uh, fairly quickly. And I'll be the first to say that I've had concerns about the Farm Bill as it worked its way uh, through the process here. Uh, there were some things in the commodity title uh, that uh, I thought could have been d done differently, um, perhaps a better policy approach, and uh, arguably uh, something that's more compliant with our world trade obligations, uh, world trade organization obligations, is in, in less market distorting. There were some number of things in the commodity title. There were some things in other titles of the bill uh, that, uh, that we had some concerns with, but there were a number of things in the Farm Bill that we worked very, very hard to have included in there, and the disaster title was one of those. And so I'm hoping that uh, as this Farm Bill works its way through the process, and hopefully as conferees get named by the House of Representatives, they can begin their work, uh, work out those, some of those differences, and uh, I will continue to be a strong proponent of the livestock disaster assistance that was created in the 2008 Farm Bill and, and included in both versions of the 2013 Farm Bill, both the one that passed the House and the one that, that passed the Senate. And I appreciate the work that uh, uh, Chairman Senator uh, Stabnow has done, our ranking member, uh, Senator Cochran, for their tireless efforts to try and get a new Farm Bill enacted as soon as possible. This past week's snowstorm is only one example of the urgency uh, behind that to get it done so that the programs can once again support our farmers and ranchers and the millions of others whose jobs rely on agriculture. And again, Madam President, in my state of South Dakota, it's our number one industry. It uh, uh, always has been, uh, probably always will be. And um, we have so many farm and ranch families who uh, look to uh, their leadership here in Washington, D.C. to provide some certainty with regard to the rules that they're going to play by. And when we do extensions like the one that we're in the middle of right now, we did a one-year extension last year of the old Farm Bill, but we don't uh, make the, the reforms, some of the changes that are necessary to update uh, farm policy, and we don't give producers the certainty that they need as they make their planning decisions for the future. And so getting a five-year, a multi-year reauthorization in place is, is really important and it's really timely. And my hope would be that uh, in the very near future, 
that the conferees can sit down, uh, they can work out the differences between the two bills, reconcile those differences, and uh, get this thing moving again. And I say that uh, not only because it's uh, critically important to these livestock producers in western South Dakota, but because it's critically important to all producers across South Dakota. The farmers in the eastern part of my state, uh, the, uh, the, the people in the, in the entire farm belt in the regions of this country that depend upon agriculture for their existence need to know what the policies are going to be, what the rules are going to be, so that they can plan and plan effectively, and so that we have the mechanisms in place so that when something like this happens, uh, that like happened in, in western South Dakota uh, this past week, there is a, a mechanism in place. There is a way in which we can respond and provide a support for the hardworking uh, farmers and ranchers and the millions of people whose jobs rely on agriculture. So, Madam President, it was a very, um, looking at those uh, images yesterday uh, was very, very gripping, very, in many ways, very disturbing. Uh, as you fly over these areas and you see these massive losses of, of livestock and and you realize uh, what that means for uh, the people who are out there every single day who for generations have made uh, their living on the land by raising uh, these cattle and have contributed in such an enormous and a significant way to the economy uh, not only of western South Dakota but uh, to this entire economy and the people who literally every single day are out there feeding not only America but feeding the world. Um, agriculture has a tremendous impact obviously domestically but it has a profound impact uh, around the world and it, it is something that uh, from an economic standpoint creates thousands and thousands and millions of jobs uh, here in this country. So I hope we can get this farm bill done. I hope the conferees will get named soon by the House and that we'll be on our way toward passage of a farm bill and hopefully the certainty that uh, producers across this country need and the ability to respond to this type of emergency. Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from New Hampshire. Thank you, Madam President. Um, we're now in the 11th day of this unnecessary government shutdown. And just as my colleague from South Dakota, Senator Thune, pointed out, there are some impacts in South Dakota um, as the result of this shutdown. We're seeing those very real consequences in New Hampshire as well, and I'm sure you're seeing those in North Dakota. <laughs> it's become clear to me by talking to people in New Hampshire that the longer the shutdown goes on, the worse the impact on families, on small businesses, on people who need the services from this government. But as difficult as the shutdown is, there's actually another crisis that looms on the horizon that would have even more disastrous consequences for our economy. And that's the possibility of a first ever default on this country's debt. For the first time ever, if we default, the country would not pay the bills that it has incurred, the bills that it has incurred because of decisions made by this Congress or previous Congresses. As economists across the ideological spectrum have warned, the consequences of a default would be severe. We could see businesses stop hiring, that would have an impact, as we're already seeing, as the result of the shutdown on the economic recovery that we're experiencing. Retirement accounts and families' nest eggs would lose much of their value in a very short time. Interest rates would rise, which would mean higher costs for consumers, for small businesses, and for the federal government, as we need to borrow. Um, and consumer confidence which is so important for small businesses and for the economy, would drop sharply. Now, some people have suggested that these are scare tactics, but these consequences are very real. And we know that because we've been here before. In 2011, which was the last time we came close to defaulting on our debt, the mere prospect of that default was enough to have significant impact on our economy. In late July and early August of 2011, the period that led up to the debt deal in 2011, the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 2,000 points. As a result, American families saw their household wealth plummet by $2.4 trillion. 
We saw a sharp drop in consumer confidence. And by the way, the current circumstances that we're in has seen a similar drop in consumer confidence over the concerns about the shutdown and the default. Um, in the last few weeks, we've seen the biggest drop in consumer confidence since Lehman Brothers collapsed in 2008. And then in 2011, our credit rating was downgraded for the first time in America's history. And the crisis in 2011 resulted in $1.3 billion in additional borrowing costs for the federal government, thereby increasing the nation's debt. So for all those people who said, um, we're, we're not going to raise the debt ceiling, we're not going to pay the bills this country has incurred because we're worried about the debt and deficits we face, the fact is that action alone increased our debt by $1.3 billion. Now, there's no question that we need to get this country's debt and deficits under control. I think all of us believe that who are here. Um, but the best way to do that is to reach a comprehensive, long-term, bipartisan agreement that looks at all areas of spending, that looks at the domestic side of the budget, at the defense side of the budget, at mandatory, mandatory programs, and at revenues. And despite the partisanship that we've seen too much of here, I still think that that kind of an agreement is possible and that that's critical. Senator Thune talked about the certainty for farmers who are not sure what's going to happen with the farm bill. But that kind of uncertainty is going to cross the economy from businesses, from um, whatever sector that you're in, because people don't know what we're going to do here in Washington about dealing with this country's long-term budget. As some of my colleagues have noted, the response to the financial crisis and the Great Recession led to a higher deficit. There's no question. The country was in trouble. Um, one of the ways we helped to address that was to spend on vital safety net programs, which increased while revenues declined, to try and stimulate the economy to put people back to work. Um, those policies, as well as the fiscal policies that have been enacted over the past decade, including two wars, tax breaks for the wealthiest Americans, all of those things meant that the country's deficit and debt had increased. But actually, in the past few years, we've seen significant progress to reduce spending and to narrow our deficits. We put in place discretionary spending caps that have reduced spending by the federal government. And we let the tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans expire, which raised additional revenue. All told, we put in place approximately $2.4 trillion in deficit reduction. Now, this hasn't been easy. There have been a lot of things that have been affected that I would not have chosen. Um, but the fact is, we are on a more sustainable budget path. And one of the best ways we can improve our budget outlook is by growing the economy, by focusing on jobs that boost revenue and decrease the need for social programs. And while we certainly have more work to do on that front, consistent job growth has helped increase revenues and reduce our deficits. So that since this president took office, we have seen this country's deficit fall by over 50%. That represents a remarkable improvement, and all that coming with the financial crisis and the recession that began in 2008. So just think about that. We've reduced this country's deficit by over 50 percent. The Congressional Budget Office projects that our deficits will drop to 2.1 percent of GDP by 2023 from its current level of 4.2 percent. So we've made great progress, and we're on a path to make even better progress. I think the budget that the Senate passed is a very good place to look at how we achieve additional savings and how we continue to grow our economy, because that budget would give us an additional $1.8 trillion in deficit reduction over the next 10 years. And it would also make very important investments in our economy in families in this country, in infrastructure, in business, in education. That's a conversation we need to have.
So I think we should go to a committee of conference on the budget. It's been unfortunate that we haven't been able to get agreement in this body to do that because we have a, a small group of people who keep preventing that. Um, but that's not really what I wanted to talk about this afternoon because what we need to do is we need to get this government back up and running. We need to agree that we should pay the bills this country has incurred and not default. And we are continuing to see, as I said when I started, the very real impact of this government shutdown on families and small businesses across New Hampshire and the country. Um, I have talked earlier on the floor about some of the small businesses that have been affected in New Hampshire. But today I want to talk about some of the federal employees who are affected. I heard from an employee at the Federal Correctional Institution in Berlin, New Hampshire. This is a medium security prison. It's new. It hasn't even been completely staffed up. doesn't have all of the inmates there yet. Um, this is from one of the employees who's currently working there without pay, as she points out. She told me that her husband had already seen his hours cut at his job. And now she says, and I quote, I sit in fear that I will not receive a paycheck at all. I will not be able to pay my mortgage payment, my student loan payments, our vehicle payments, or any other debts. I also assume that my daughter's daycare is not going to accept an IOU. I also will not have the money to buy pellets for my wood stove or fuel for my furnace for the upcoming winter. She went on to tell me that she's worried about the long-term mental and physical well-being of those who are working without paychecks at the prison because many of her colleagues are living paycheck to paycheck. Now, we've talked a lot about the courage and dedication that many of our Capitol Police showed on October the 3rd during the shooting incident here. It was extraordinary to see people put their lives on the line without getting paid. The same is true of people who are working at our federal prisons. You know, they're putting their lives on the line every day they go into work in a dangerous environment. I heard from another furloughed, furloughed employee at the prison. She said, I'm a single parent with two sons. My sons depend on me and only me. I have to pay for my son's lunch and extracurricular activities, which keep him out of trouble and give him something to do. I also have medication that my son and I need on a monthly basis, which we can't go without. The oil here in Berlin is absolutely high. Berlin's in the north country of New Hampshire, so it gets cold there in the winter. She concluded, what are we going to say to the bill collectors? Can anyone answer that? What kind of answers can we give to somebody who's putting her, their lives on the line every day, um, working for the government to protect all of us, and yet we're not giving them the paychecks that they earned. I also heard from a furloughed employee with the Department of Agriculture in New Hampshire who's on furlough. She said, it's an understatement to say I'm a bit anxious and scared. I live from paycheck to paycheck. She told me she's worried about going into debt as a result of this shutdown. And she said, I love my job at USDA, and I feel I make a difference every day to make this a better world. She urged me to work with my colleagues here to get her back to work. Those are just a few examples of the stories that we're hearing every day from people in New Hampshire who are affected by this shutdown. The consequences are very real and they get worse with every day that it goes on. The as bad as that is, the consequences of a default of this country refusing to pay its debts are even worse. Because while Social Security and Medicare have not been affected by the shutdown, that would change if we default. A default could delay or disrupt Social Security checks that are due to go out at the beginning of November. Medicare, Medicaid, veterans benefits, military salaries, all of those could be affected by a default. And according to the Treasury, delayed or disrupted payments would prevent 57.5 million Americans from receiving Social Security benefits in a timely manner and interfere with payments to 3.4 million veterans. 
This could put the most vulnerable in jeopardy and prevent them from receiving the benefits that they er have earned. Now, that's why I think the majority in both parties, in both chambers in Congress, recognize that defaulting on this country's obligations is not an option. My former colleague and fellow Senator, Judd Gregg, who is a Republican, and while we don't agree on everything, this is one issue we certainly agree on. In an op-ed published by the Hill newspaper, he said that Brinkman, brinksmanship on default is, I quote, the political equivalent of playing Russian roulette with all the chambers of a gun loaded. It is the ultimate no-win strategy. A default would lead to some level of chaos in the debt markets, which would lead to a significant contraction in economic activity, which would lead to job losses, which would lead to higher spending by the federal government and lower tax revenues, which would lead to more debt. In other words, as Senator Gregg says so well, it is short-sighted and it's irresponsible. There is no doubt we need to keep working on a long-term budget for this country, but we have to do it in a way that is responsible. That's why I certainly hope that the Senate will be able to agree on the legislation that's currently before this body. Um, I hope the House will come to the table. I hope we can all agree that allowing this country to default on our debts, to not pay our bills, would have disastrous consequences and we are not going to be that irresponsible. So, Madam President, we still have some time to get this done, not long. Um, and so far, the financial markets and the American people have been more than patient. But everybody is frustrated. Everybody understands that it is time for us to act and to act now. So thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor.